I want to tell you about how energy use has changed even in recent times. And that's actually pretty amazing. Many times these types of statistics are very boring. But recently there's been some big changes. Let's compare U.S. energy use in 2018, some of the most recent statistics, back to 2006, not all that long ago. Now, one thing that hasn't changed is the total amount of energy use. This number goes up and down, it's always around 100, and I need to define this unit of a quad. A quad is 10 to the 15th British thermal units. British thermal units were the only country in the world that still uses English units just about, but uh, if we wanted to put this into something that was more universal, that's about 10 to the 18th joules. Not exactly, but pretty close. All right, so that's energy units. And you also notice here that the total amount of oil used, the number one energy component of our mix, is also not that dramatically different. But the next statistic is very telling. Let's compare natural gas and coal. And you can see that their totals are both about 44 quads. This is what we use to make electricity. The primary use used to be coal for electricity, but today it's natural gas. And this change has happened because of fracking because we've been able to actually extract natural gas from rock formations that we weren't able to get out before. Because of that, we are energy independent. North American energy independent because we're importing from Canada, but between Canada and the US, we produce all of the energy that we consume. And this switch to natural gas is a big part of that. There's also something very else great about not using so much coal. Per actual unit of energy, if I take natural gas, which is methane, and I burn it compared to coal, which is basically CH many, many, many times over, I make less CO2 per unit of energy produced. So the switch from Coal to natural gas has actually lowered the amount of CO2 that the United States makes. The next on the list, and these are all done in sort of the order of energy use, is nuclear power. Nuclear power produces about 20% of our electricity and about, you can see, 8% of our total energy. And that also hasn't changed over time. Hydroelectric power, that number goes up and down just a little bit depending on how much it rains in a given year. So that's not a big change. But now we come to the renewables. And I think this is pretty remarkable as well. Notice that we are 10 times the amount of wind energy that we had simply 13 years ago. A lot of this has been come happening because of government programs. The government has put in a um, producer price incentive so that everybody that makes wind will get at least a couple cents per kilowatt hour from the government. And this has been done in order to promote this renewable resource. Still note, though, that this is 2.5%. Many people, if you come up on the street, you say, wow, how much energy has come from renewables? The guess is always 10%, 20%, 30%. But if you see, if I take wind, and um, we'll go down here to uh, solar eventually. Well, we have to keep going down here to get the solar. You can see that wind and solar and even biofuels all add up to something still around 5%. Can it grow? Yes. Can it replace the fossil fuels? No. So what are these other things? Why do I have the little waste percentage after wood? That's because when I put wood down there, it's not people's fireplaces. Yeah, that's a small component of it. Maybe 0.25 quads are used to actually heat homes. But the rest is the paper product industry. 
If you cut down a tree, you've got bark, you've got sawdust. What do you do with it all? Throw it away? No, you can burn it. Burn it, make the electricity, make the energy that's needed to actually make those wood products. So that's great, and it's about constant. Biofuels, both taking soybeans and making biodiesel and taking corn and making ethanol has grown, and you can see that's a factor of three in the last um, 15 years or so. And then we finally come to solar, which is up to 1% now of the energy going into the U.S., and you can see that's grown, again, a very large percentage. Both of these resources, solar and wind, are continuing to grow, but not at that kind of pace. And I would imagine if I do another video in five or ten years, maybe those things will be doubled. But do not expect those type of renewables, in part because the wind stops and it gets dark at night, to put a dent in our fossil fuel use. Some places we still take garbage and turn it into energy, and you can see that those numbers haven't changed much. And the last energy source, geothermal, comes basically from one power plant in Northern California, and the rocks underneath it, where we pump down water and bring up steam, are getting a little cooler over time. So this is your balance of energy by source in the U.S. So I had showed you just two dates, but what about a graph of over time? So here is energy use from 1950 all the way to the present. And there's a couple really fascinating things. You can see that for a while, the U.S. was completely self-sufficient. The uh, consumption and production line lined up. Then we started importing oil. Oil shocks of the 70s went down a little bit. And then 20 years of steady growth of imports as our consumption went up. But then fascinatingly, sometime about 20, 25 years ago, our consumption has been flat. And this is really a testament to U.S. technology, ingenuity, not just U.S., Western Europe, uh, Asia, Japan, all of the modern economies. We have figured out how to make more stuff with less energy per unit thing. Our growth, our GDP, our economic output has grown, but our total energy consumption has stayed flat. Of course, a lot of it was from imports. And then only recently, from about 2004 on, as we learned how to extract fossil fuels, both oil and natural gas, from oil shale, which North America has in abundance, we now reach this point where we have the same amount of consumption and production in the United States. You say, oh, look, we're still importing. Sure, but we're also exporting, all right? Because it's a continent-sized country. It's easier to ship from one side and pull it in from another from other places, especially from Canada. So that's pretty interesting, okay? What are those energy sources? Because that was just a total number. This gives you the breakdown per resource. And what you can see really going up here, right, is the natural gas, okay? And this has allowed us to switch from coal as our dominant source for electrical production to natural gas, which has also done wonders for the environment. And we do see a renewable line coming up here, coming up here, which is also a good thing. If we look at consumption, you can see that we get our total number and we have a much bigger rise in natural gas and a drop in coal. So this is consumption by source and production by source. Well, that's the United States. So what about the rest of the world? Have these numbers looked the same? How do things change? How much energy is being used? While the US and the European economies and um, Japan and Korea are just about in the same type of flat energy use. 
there's been some other really big changes in the last 15 or 20 years. Let me show you these statistics. Let's compare energy use by country, and these statistics are a little bit older because it takes several years to bring in statistics from other countries. So 2016 here at the end of 2019 is still the best I got, but I'll compare it to something like, you know, 12 years ago. And the first things I want to point out is that it used to be that the U.S. was the uh, largest consumption of energy, but now it's China. And it's not just a little bit, China, it's huge. And you can see this growth in a mere 12 years of doubling China's energy consumption, where the U.S. Is, and most of Western Europe has stayed relatively flat. Of course, there are four times as many people in China than the United States, and clearly they want to rise to the same standards of living, and which generally means the same energy use. If we go to the next couple countries down, we see that we have Russia in there, and again, no dramatic changes. But then we see India. India also has around four times as many people as the United States, and it's still a more energy poor economy, but it's on the move too. And I would much expect that this Indian number over the next decade or two is going to grow in a similar manner to what China grew. If we look at the rest, we can see we've got um, uh, Japan, Canada, Germany, South Korea, Brazil, Iran, Saudi Arabia. Numbers are uh, slightly different, but not dramatically so. And you can tell we have growth in places like Brazil. You look at Iran and you look at Saudi Arabia and you say, wait, these are our countries why are those on the list? Why don't we see you know, more of the European countries or Mexico or other economies like that? And the reason there, especially for Saudi Arabia, is that the actual process of taking oil out of the ground and then refining it uses a lot of energy, about 10%. So since Saudi Arabia is one of the world's largest oil producers, Instead of just shipping crude oil, if they actually refine it first and turn it into gasoline or other products, they might as well do the value added there, they will use quite a bit of energy in that process. And that also applies to Iran, who's an energy exporter as well. And part of that energy use is in the refining aspect of selling fossil fuels. Then we come to the total in the world. It's not just these countries, but if I add up all the countries, and you can see that number is significantly higher. And that number is going to continue to grow. Let me uh, graph energy use over time. And I've graphed the world, and you can see this sharp rise. If you want to think about what's going to happen in the world, you've got to think about this number and this graph where the U.S. energy use has turned over and become flat. Countries like China, which are here in the green, are still on a steep slope. India is not on the graph, but if it was, it would be on a steep slope. And this contributes to the very steep slope of world energy use. Someday, this world energy use may hit something and top over, like the U.S. did. That day is far in the future, which means we're going to need energy resources for the future across the world. And that's what you need to know about energy then and now, here and there.